Hello, Every Nation family. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is still Andilem Dingani, and you are here for installment four of our sermon series, Galatians. We're joined again by Pastor Julia. So buckle up, listen up, and take notes. Hey there, family. My name is Julian Nell, and I'm the worship pastor here at Every Nation Faith City. And welcome to week four of our sermon series on the book of Galatians. We've been doing a study on the book of Galatians for the last couple of weeks. And honestly, it's been one of my favorite series that we have ever done. If you haven't checked out parts one to three, please go take a look at them. They will literally change your life. And I'm not just saying it to say it. Um, but And in the same way that you wouldn't start a movie marathon on movie number six or seven or movie number four, I really want to encourage you to check out weeks one to three. A lot of what we're going to be sharing today is going to make a lot more sense with the context of the previous three sermons in mind. Before we jump in, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for adopting us into your family, and we thank you for the gift of your word and for the privilege that we have to study it together. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul wrote two kinds of letters when he wrote, uh, and the first one was to pastors. Now, this was specifically, think about this as a WhatsApp or a text message or an email written in order to help a pastor to better take care of the people that God has entrusted him with. And the other kind of letter would be like a sermon uh, that would be, or, or a pre-recorded uh, a video sermon uh, that he would have uh, delivered to local churches and to, uh, to, to, to communities where he had actually planted churches or uh, that he had been connected to. Uh, and he would do different things. He would either use this as an opportunity to encourage or an opportunity to provide correction or to say, hey, we need to talk about X, Y, and Z that happened because this isn't right and this is actually taking you away from where God wants you to be. Now, fortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, Galatians was a book where Paul actually wrote some corrections and he said, hey, you guys aren't supposed to live in these following ways. And the reason why he wrote it like that is because he wanted the local believers uh, who had just gotten saved to not be influenced by a group called the Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers were Jewish, some of them believers, uh, some of them not, but essentially it's this group that said, look, in order for you to be saved by Jesus, you have to essentially become Jewish. You have to uh, adhere by Jewish customs and culture in order to be saved. And Paul actually addresses that in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And uh, so we're not going to go over that right now. Today we're going to jump into chapter 4. And we're going to pick up from 4, verse 8 to 9. And uh, here's what happens. So Paul writes and he says, Formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to beings that by nature are not God's. Now, however, that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly elemental principles? How can you want to be enslaved to them again? So having been slaves and being slaves to sin and being slaves to different things in our lives, uh, this sounds weird, but a lot of times we want to default back to our old approaches. Uh, how can you want to be enslaved to them again, is what Paul says. Now, it's it's kind of a weird concept if you think about it, wanting to be slaves again. But think about it. I think a lot of times we owe someone or we have this feeling where someone paid for something on our behalf and we want to make it up to them. And we feel like, you know what, if I just do X, Y, and Z, if I just, if I just help more, if I'm just nicer to them, uh, if I apologize more, if I do good things, I'm actually going to earn my favor or I'm going to uh, uh, repay them for what they've given me. But that's not how the gospel works. 
That's really not how the gospel works. A lot of times we want a set of rules to live by. We want a set of rules to, to adhere in order to have a good standing with God. We want to have 51, at least 51%, a passing grade of good deeds in order to get into a relationship with God or in order to get to heaven. But that's not how it works with our relationship with God. It needs to be, well, exactly that. It needs to be a relationship. Now, Galatians 4 talks about a couple of things, um, and uh, I'm just going to point out three things for us to keep in mind. The first thing is we need to see God as our Father. Matthew 7, verse 9 to 11, uh, the New Living Translation says the following. It says, You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? Something that a lot of parents uh, tell their kids is uh, act like you live here, <laughs> which usually means clean up around the house. Um, but have you ever had a good friend that you were super comfortable with that you would uh, go to their house um, I remember for me, whenever I'd go to a good friend's house, the first couple of times you're really nervous and you're careful and you're, uh, you use coasters uh, and you uh, are very, very careful and you, you keep checking with your friend, is it okay for me to be here? Is it okay for me to be here? Um, you kind of feel slightly out of place at times. But at some stage, uh, depending on your relationship with, with the person with the family, you actually become family or you become like family, uh, which means that you have new access. There are certain rooms and places in the house that you can go that you might not have been allowed to go at first. Uh, you might even be allowed to grab stuff from the fridge. Um, you have new access and you have new responsibilities. Now, the thing is, a lot of times we look at our relationship with God as a friend's house instead of our father's house. Somewhere where we, if I do enough, if there's enough of a back and forth, I've, I've been in nice, I've adhered to the rules and principles, then I can eat, then I'm allowed into certain places of intimacy. Instead of thinking about it like our parents' house, our father's house, our good father's house who does not withhold things. If evil parents still provide for their kids, how much more so a good father? And... We have access with this familiarity. And a lot of times uh, what we have to realize is this formality gets replaced by familiarity when we have a relationship with God. You've become family. You and I have become family. The second thing to keep in mind is to approach God through relationship and not through rules. Now, one of the most confusing things in our Christian walk, in our relationship with God, is this whole idea of works. Uh, do we work to get saved? No, no. Uh, but do we need to obey God? Well, yes. Uh, so we obey him to get accepted. Well, no, that's not it. Okay, so, but we still need to obey God. Yes. Uh, now, you and I could probably see why this is confusing or this can be confusing, especially to new Christians. Now, I'm going to try and clarify that today um, using a few analogies before we jump back into scripture. Um Think about the following analogy. So uh, the issue uh, actually isn't working or not working. This is something to keep in mind. The issue isn't working or not working. It's the order in which these things happen. One of the first analogies I want to use is the following. Uh, think about a cake. So there are ingredients and then there is a process. Now, the ingredients are uncooked uh, usually <laughs> they're raw and uh, they don't work on their own. And uh, think about the following. If I were to cook the eggs first, if I were to, I don't know what you do with sugar. I don't know what you do with milk, how you would cook that. But imagine I cook all the ingredients separately and then I, I just try and stack them on top of each other to make a cake. It's not going to be a cake because even though the elements are correct, the process that I followed in putting them together, uh, because I cooked first or because I didn't combine it the right way, it can be all the right ingredients, but if the process isn't 
done in the right way or it isn't approached the right way, it's not going to be a good cake. Now, in the same way, when it comes to our relationship with God, it's not just the, the ingredients of obedience, the ingredients of purity. It's not just the ingredient of holiness or abstinence. It is the process and it's how they come together. And a lot of times we feel like, okay, cool. I'm just going to fix all these things first and then I'm going to come to God. But that's not how it works. Uh, think about math. A lot of times uh, when when, you, when you're in high school or when you're first learning math, one of the quickest ways for us to lose points on exams or to, to struggle with math is if we don't know the order of operations. Uh, I don't know if you remember those lovely little math equations where they have the pluses, the minuses, the the divided by's and the lightning bolts or whatever else they put in there. I wasn't that good at math. Um, but all those little things, if you don't know the order in which to do the, the to solve the equation, then what's going to happen is you're going to end up jumping ahead on certain things and you're not going to get to the right answer. In the same way that the right ingredients in the wrong order and the wrong process, if they're not processed correctly, they don't work in the same way. Just having holiness and just having this and just having that, if we don't approach it correctly, then we end up swinging away from the true gospel, the gospel, uh, the life-giving gospel that we are saved by grace through faith. And if and through trusting God, we are actually in... Uh, it enables us to go into a place where we can obey. Whereas if we, if we have the process uh, mismatched or we have it out of order, what ends up happening is we live in this cycle where we feel like we're doing all the right things, but at the end of the day, we're missing God. Now, the last analogy I want to use before we go into the next point is the following. It's John 5 verse 39 to 40 before I give the example, and it's this. Jesus talks to the Pharisees and he says, you search the scriptures because you think they will give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. A lot of times what we do is we get hooked on the process. We get hooked on what we need to do and we miss Jesus. We miss God. You can do all the right things and miss God. So the last analogy is think about joining a gym. Uh, if you are signing up or you want to join and get a gym membership, uh, fun fact, you don't have to work out in order to have a gym contract. You don't have to, okay, I have to prove to them I can do 300 sit-ups, 200 push-ups before I can even get into the gym. In fact, I can do all those things and not get a gym membership. Whereas someone who never works out can go and get a gym membership right now by <laughs> actually signing up, by going to the gym and saying, hey, I would like a gym contract. I would like to go work out. And here, But here's the thing, is once you sign up, yeah, then there's a workout. Then you get to work out. And why do you work out then? Uh, do you have to work out? No, you get to work out. And what happens is as you work out, you're actually, and yeah, it takes discipline. And yeah, there's stuff like that that happens. But... When you work from a place of, uh, uh, if, if you work from a place of, you know what, I have a gym membership, I don't need a workout to keep my gym membership, but I work out because I have one and you and because I, I have a heart for, you know what, I wanna improve myself, I wanna work on this. Uh, if you have that in that order, then you're gonna benefit. Whereas you can work out all the time and never get a gym membership if you're waiting for the gym to accept you based off of your good exercises. We need to reverse our order. And this brings us to the to the third thing we need to keep in mind with this sermon, and it's, I need to give God my whole heart. Jeremiah 29, verse 13 to 14 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Now here's something that we need to know, and it's that relationship changes everything. I think a lot of times uh, we approach God with formality. We talked about this before. We approach him with this formality and we think that, you know what, if I just use big enough words, then God will accept me. But here's the thing, that relationship, that personal approach is how we have, like, this is how we have access to God. 
It's not by adhering to rules and principles. We talked about this a lot last week and the week before, so I would encourage you to check those things out. Now, the thing is we are called not to be slaves, but to be sons. Now, I know it's 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 weird, especially ladies, if you think about yourself as a son, but um, we guys have to deal with being a, the bride of Christ. So I guess all things being considered were kind of equal in this sense. But yeah, back to our regularly scheduled program. Galatians 3 verse 26 says, You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 4 verse 4 to 7 says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Now, here's something to keep in mind is uh, Abba, Father. Abba is uh, the, the Aramaic word for dad. So if if you go to, to, to the Middle East, what you'll usually hear if... If you go outside, as you'll hear a lot of kids, especially in Israel, you'll hear a lot of kids yelling out, Abba, 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 uh, in the same way that over here or in your local context, you might hear children yelling out, Papa, Papa, Mama, Mama, uh, Daddy, uh, Dad. And the reason why you hear that is because, well, they have a father. They have someone there that they have that relationship with. The thing is, a lot of times we view ourselves uh as, as slaves because we think of God only as our master and not as our father. Another thing is the slave is an employee, but the son is an heir. So Romans 8 verse 17 says, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Philippians 2 verse 13, uh, 12 to 13 says, Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Now, I just want to break this apart for a second in Philippians 2, verse 12 to 13, where it says, work hard to show the what? To show the results of your salvation. It's not working hard to get salvation. It's to show the results of it. I am working from a place of a gym membership and not from a place of trying to earn a gym membership. And... From there on, it says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire. So where do we get the desire to do the right things? We get that from God. Unless God has transformed us from the inside, we will not be able to tr- to, to, to work on external transformation. We won't be able to change external habits if we haven't had an internal change in our hearts. I want to say the following, and it's the slave is driven by duty. The son is driven by devotion. And I want to end on this. And it's if just just kind of pointing out the difference between these two things. And it's if someone is on your mind versus someone is in your heart. Now, in your heart sounds a bit weird and we have a lot of associations. But but, but let me try and simplify this by by putting it in this way. Um, My siblings aren't always on my mind, but they're always in my heart. What that means is if I if I get to my parents' place and uh, I, I try to find my younger two siblings, uh, Annie and Dee, and I go around the house and I don't see them, then I'm going to ask my parents, hey, where's Annie and Dee? Uh, if they go, I don't know, and I look around the entire house, I can't find them, give them a call, can't find them, then I'm going to keep looking for them until I find them. I'm going to start calling friends. I'm going to uh, ask around. I'm going to uh, try and retrace their steps, not because, oh my gosh, they're not going to be my siblings anymore, or, oh my gosh, they're going to hate me, but because I love them, I'm going to look for them. And there's very little, believe it or not, any Andy, that I wouldn't do for you guys because I love them. And I think a lot of times uh, when we look at our relationship with God, we keep thinking about him as, you know, what this is someone I have to do stuff for. Otherwise, he's not going to accept me. But if he's in our hearts instead of just on our minds and we feel like he's just looking over our shoulder, 
if we feel like he's just looking over our shoulder, it's really going to limit how we interact with him. However, if he's in our hearts and we care about him and we love him, then obedience is a natural outflowing of that relationship. The last thing that I want to mention is the following, and it's a lot of times what we do is we reflect the picture of our earthly fathers, the pictures of our earthly fathers onto God the Father. But it's the equivalent of looking at a disfigured action figure or a little Lego person in comparison with a real person the real picture of who God is. And I want to encourage all of us today and I want to go and just just pray for us that whatever our relationship with our earthly fathers might be, whatever we feel like is limiting us, I want to encourage us today to not superimpose the images of our earthly fathers over God the Father who being good and being perfect has given us every perfect thing and who doesn't just want us to fulfill a function who doesn't want us to fulfill a function but he wants us to be family so let me just pray for us today father we love you we pray right now that you come and you change our perspective you uh, help us to forgive our earthly fathers you help us to uh, revisit not the bad memories and not the stuff that, 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 that have come and blocked our perspective, but to revisit scripture that reminds us that we are your sons and daughters and that we're not just in this relationship to do stuff and it's not we're not working things out and we're not working out in order to earn a relationship with you. But because we have a relationship with you, we are able to work on these disciplines and we're able to work on these things not to earn your love but out of a place of love empowered by you just pray a blessing over everyone who's watching this in jesus name amen thank you so much what an amazing word it surely blessed me and i know it blessed you too now i just want to take this moment to thank you for your generosity it's because of your giving that we're able to do what we do best and that's bring supernatural transformation to our world one person at a time and I want to encourage you to keep giving and partnering with us in the way you have because you've allowed us and you're helping us in reaching nations and people that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to through our online platform. Also, this is a great time to remind you to like, follow, and subscribe on all our social media platforms to stay in the loop with what we're doing. God is moving and you want to be a part of it. Family, share this word with someone you have no idea the impact you could make on someone's life by simply sharing this. The Lord is moving and changing hearts as we speak. Also, if you want to get in contact with us, we're right here. The details are on the screen. We'd love to hear from you, to hear your story, to pray with you, and to answer any questions you might have. That's all from our end. Please, God bless you. Goodbye.